Our text is again from the book of John, chapter 13. In a moment, we'll be looking at verses 34 and 35. By way of introduction, I simply pose this question to you. How can anyone know that we are truly Christians, members of the body of Christ? Is it because we call ourselves Christians, which means of Christ, members of the Lord's church? Is it because one is right in doctrine, church organization, worship, and so on? Where clearly it's important to have all these things. But we should not think that by these things alone we truly prove that we are Christians. Or that by these things alone the world will know us to be Christians. If we do that, we miss the point Jesus made and we make a sad mistake. Shortly before our Lord was crucified for us, he identified for us a key mark of being a Christian. He gave, verse 34, a new commandment. I give unto you that ye love one another, as I have loved you, that ye also love one another. By this shall all men know that ye are my disciples, if ye love one another. Uh, Brett didn't know when he picked that song, Wonderful Story of Love, that I would be dealing with this any more than when he picked that one this morning that it would fit so well, but they do. And we need to realize what our Lord's teaching here. Notice he calls it a new commandment. Well, God had been dealing with man for thousands of years by this time. But he says, I'm giving you a new commandment, John 13, 34. And notice it was the command to love one another. In our opposition to false love, just like false doctrine or anything, that doesn't mean we're opposed to what Jesus taught or what true love really is, whether it's love of God, love of our family, or love of our fellow man, or loving our neighbors, ourselves, and what that means. But he said, by this all will know who truly are Christians. Verse 35. Since love for one another is how people are going to know that we truly belong to Jesus, that we are His, that we are faithful servants of Christ, that we are Christians, that we're citizens of the kingdom of heaven, members of the body of Christ, then we must know what, watch it, kind, K-I-N-D, kind of love that is. And we must develop it. We must attain to it. We must develop it. And we must demonstrate it in our conduct. Or how is anybody going to see anything of love or whatever else there is in our life? Now the question that arises is this. Do we know what kind of love it is? And do we know how to develop it in our lives? And do we know how to demonstrate it in our conduct or our actions? So in this sermon, we want to understand and exhort each other as children of God to know and to practice the love that Jesus says is a new commandment. But it is a commandment. A commandment's given to us to obey. So he said, by this all we'll know. We truly belong to Him, and I want people to know that I belong to Jesus Christ, that I am faithful to Him, that I believe that He is the way, the truth, and the life, and that no man comes to the Father but by Him. So we begin our study with simply noting the kind of love this love is. In view of the fact God's always loved the world in the sense of caring for it, wanting the best for it as He defines what's best, there had always been familiar love. There had always been love of friends and so on. If you look to the law of Moses in Leviticus 19, verse 18, the Jew was taught to love your neighbors yourself. But Jesus declared a 
new commandment I give to you, that ye love one another. Something I must do, you must do. It's a special love, or love done in a special way, thereby Jesus is calling Christians really to a new and higher standard of love. Now, if it's new, it can't be what was before. It's like worshiping God in spirit and in truth. God had always expected people from the days of Cain and Abel to worship him according to his will, to act out of faith, which comes by his word, and so forth. And yet, the worship done under the New Testament in the church by Christians is a higher plane of worship because it's further up the spiritual plane. And the same is true when it comes to this love that uh, will cause everyone to know that we are truly Christians. The first thing I'd point out about it is a genuine sacrificial love. Sacrifice is where this is very important to me. I enjoy it. I love it. But I'm going to give it up for something else. I really need it, but I'm going to give it up for something else. And Jesus said in talking about this new commandment to love, as I have loved you. Now let that sink in then you ought to also love one another in the same way. That, to say the least, is a mouthful. And it's very interesting that Paul would instruct through the Spirit in the New Testament of Christ concerning the love husbands are have for their wives. And this ought to be frightening to us. To love them as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Now, frankly, I don't think a husband ever fully and completely reaches that stage because it's always room for growth and development as long as you're on this earth and capable of growing and developing. But there's the goal. There's what we shoot for. We don't lower it. There it is. Loving your wife as Christ loved the church. Notice the sacrifice and gave himself for it. Well, he's saying you love one another. He's not just saying you're near and dear family members, your loving wife, your loving husband, whatever. He's saying your brethren. Some brethren are not easy to love. Now, the first way you begin to love brethren is to admit that some of them are not easy to love. And you may want to say, I'm one of them. But you've got to start somewhere, and the best place to start is when you look in the mirror. Now, a fellow called me many, many years ago. He wasn't a happy camper. He wanted to know where his problem was, and I just wasn't feeling like dealing with him. I said, just take a long look in the mirror. There's the place to begin. Well, he didn't appreciate that much, but that was the truth. And the fact of the matter is, that's the truth. You and me own anything when it comes to serving God. We begin with ourselves. As Paul told the Ephesian elders, take heed to yourselves and of the flock over which the Holy Ghost has made you overseers. He told Timothy that too as a young preacher in doing what he ought to do as an evangelist of truth. Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. So this love is patterned after our Lord's love for us. Now, do you think you'll ever attain to that? <laughs> Not flawlessly. There will always be room for growth and development. But this is what makes it a new and higher standard of love. The love Jesus had for us can simply be captured in one word. I've already mentioned it. Sacrifice. Sacrificial. What did Christ give up to save my soul? And we sing a song sometimes before we observe the Lord's Supper to show forth His death till He come again. And we point out that we are mindful of the fact in the act of worship and in certain songs that we realize he gave his life for me. Our Lord explained in John 15, 13, greater love hath no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. The Apostle John wrote, and John was there hearing all of this because this is the beginning in John 13, 14, 15, 16 and there where the Lord is talking to the apostles to a great extent regarding their work. 
He wrote to Christians many years later, 1 John chapter 3, verses 16 through 18. Hereby perceive we the love of God. We see the love of God. We understand the love of God. Because He laid down His life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren. Are you willing to lay down your life for me and am I really to lay down my life for you? Then he goes ahead, But whoso hath this world's good and seeth his brother have need and he shutteth up his bowels of compassion from him, how dwelleth the love of God in him? Then he brings it all together. My little children, let us not love in word, neither in tongue, but in deed and in truth. Again, 1 John 3, 16 through 18. Now watch the last few words. We love in deed and in truth. Well, Jesus said that the truth would set us free. And he tells us the truth is found in the words of the gospel. John 17, 17. Father, sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. The words of the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. Paul said, preach the word, be instant in season and out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all wrongs, suffering, and doctrine. Now, we're to love in deed and truth. Well, what guides us in the deeds we do? Whatsoever you do, that's a deed, isn't it? Whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, Colossians 3, 17, by His authority. Jesus said to his apostles, John 14, verse 15, If you love me, American Standard says, Ye will keep my commandments. Paul wrote, Be ye therefore followers of God, as dear children. Now watch. And walk in love, as Christ has loved us, and hath given himself as an offering and a sacrifice to God for sweet-smelling savor. Ephesians 5, verses 1 and 2. Now, that may help us understand why Paul said so much in one way or the other about the sufferings that he underwent for the cause of Christ and the privation that came upon him or he suffered for doing Christ's work. That's just natural if you're going to serve Christ in view of what he did for us. It exemplified, it's exemplified in the lives of the first Christians. Why you have in Acts 2, 44 through 45, that they sold what they had. They had all things common. They were willing to go that far to supply the needs of those who didn't have things. You see, they were at the very beginning practicing that new commandment, that sacrificial love following the example of Jesus laying down his life for his friends. Then you have also Paul using the church in Macedonia as an example. Well, after what we studied just this far, you'll know why the Holy Spirit had him use them as an example. Moreover, brother, uh, moreover brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed upon the churches of Macedonia. How that in a great trial of affliction, the abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded into the riches of the liberality. For their power I bear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did, not as we hoped. Watch the sacrifice. But first gave their own selves to the Lord and to us by the will of God. No wonder then the Holy Spirit had Paul select those brethren to say, here is the new commandment being practiced. Now, that's very important to understand because life was cheap back in those days. If you think things are a mess now as far as people not caring for one another, just study those days. And life was exceedingly cheap. Life was brutal. There was little that said, I care anything about you. There was everything that said, I care about me, and if it takes running over you to take care of me, that's just the way it is. And the whole world governed itself that way. You say the world's that way today. Well, it's amazing how much the truth of the New Testament has influenced Western civilization to where that 
tended to tone down over the years, though it's never erased in worldly people. And now we see it coming back, the less influence the New Testament has over people's conduct. This love that's a sacrificial love that follows in the footsteps of Jesus is a visible love. Notice in verse 35, John 13, he says, By this love all will know that ye are my disciples. A disciple is one who learns. He has a teacher and he's seeking to learn what that teacher has to say. He's disciplined by the message, by the information provided. Our Lord's comment implies that this kind of love then is something we can see in one another and the world can see it in members of the church. It can be seen by everybody. Of course, the brethren, too. Now, if it's a visible love, being that love itself is a concept, but this is something that can be seen in our words and lives, then a visible love requires that a love go beyond, or oh, it's included, but it goes beyond what we're doing in this assembly in our church buildings. These are very brief times out of a whole week that we spend together. So this love goes far beyond that. It can be observed by those in the world when we're on the job, when we're at school, wherever we are, by our neighbors, the local garage sale, wherever it may be, by the people you work with. Sometimes we may not show forth this new love when we're out among the heathen. But that's where it needs to be shown more than any other time. Not just when we're assembled together to worship God, of people of like precious faith. So by some means non-Christians. They need the opportunity uh, to observe Christianity in action. That's what really is being said. To see the love of Jesus practiced daily in the lives of his servants, of Christians. It is a wonderful thing, a proper thing, a correct thing, for a church to be commended for being a warm and friendly church, being hospitable. The Bible teaches those things. And of course, while we're assembled, that's still good. I've seen situations where brethren didn't care for one another to the point where one would sit in one place and one in the other and go out different doors to keep from having to speak to one another. Well, if that's Christianity, I missed it somewhere down the road. But being a warm and friendly church in our assemblies doesn't fulfill the command to have a sacrificial and visible love pattern after our Lord's love for us wherever we go all day long every day. That means even the in-laws we don't like. If we truly desire to show this kind of love in our daily conduct, then you ask the question, well, where do I begin? Well, this carries us into one of the things I said earlier. We begin by developing that love in our own minds. Look with me over to what Paul had to say to the Thessalonians because God was teaching them about this love. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 9 through 10. 1 Thessalonians 4, 9 through 10. But as touching brotherly love, Ye need not that I write unto you. Now watch it. For ye yourselves are taught of God to love one another. And indeed ye do it toward all the brethren which are in all Macedonia. But we beseech you, brethren, that ye increase more and more. He commends them for having such brotherly love and says you learned it by being taught of God. But then he says abound in it more and more. Notice how he links this new commandment of love being practiced with being taught. 
This is a love that can be taught. It's not just some sort of uh, emotional thing that makes you feel good and you see the brethren coming and everybody gives a good warm handshake or a big squeeze or whatever. Uh, no, it, it means that you are interested in doing good as the New Testament defines the good towards your brethren. Loving them as God defines it. You're willing to listen to the truth. If the truth can teach you the plan of salvation of how to become a Christian, it'll teach you how to live the Christian life. And it'll teach you how to practice this new commandment. So certainly God's own love for us teaches us how to love. Now I know that can be used in that way because I turn over to 1 John chapter 4 and I see the Holy Spirit through John writing to Christians and he says plainly, beginning in verse 9 of chapter 4, In this was manifested the love of God toward us, because that God sent His only begotten Son into the world, that we might live through Him. Now watch what he says. Herein is love. Not that we loved God, but that He loved us and sent His Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought also to love one another. And then all you got to do is look at what he says about the kind of love that is. It's doing unto others as you would have them do unto you. It's respecting the other person's views. I've seen this happen all my life in the church among some members. We're going to have our way whether it has to do with stomping your foot in the floor or not. Now they won't come out and say that but just watch what goes on. And you see people bristle. This especially is so over the years I've seen in churches where cantankerous and contentious brethren didn't like what the elders decided. And they just didn't understand the place of elders in the churches. God set them in there, nor the work that the elders are to do. I remember one brother telling me, for he served as an elder for a long time, in Muskogee, Oklahoma, this happened long years before I was born that he told about this. But he said, here's a man I learned as I served with him as an elder to know that he really understood what it was to be an elder. He said, when we would discuss things, that we might have some pretty uh, heated discussion over what to do, how to do it, when to do it. But when he saw that the majority of the eldership was for one way or against a certain way, he immediately just simply gave up what he was doing and went right along and we agreed together and said he would get into the pulpit and say the elders have decided when he was one of the ones that was as much opposed to it in the discussion as anybody. That's an elder. That's a qualified man. He's not self-willed. He's interested in the other elders and what they think. And how could it be otherwise? And that's the love we're talking about here, just as it's applied in that one instance to the elders working one another as brothers in the Lord and doing the job they're going to do. Our Heavenly Father on sacrificial love for us and sending His Son to suffer and to bleed and to die for our sins on the cross, a prime example of how we're mindful of each other's needs and the rights of others. We learn from Jesus in his own example, as I've said, the pattern that he set. Hereby perceive we the love of God because he laid down his life for us. And we ought to lay down our lives for the brethren, 1 John 3, 16. And the more we think about the example of Jesus' life and death, the more likely we will love one another as he did. We would do well to see put in our minds what is said in the scriptures on think on these things we're to be stirred up by the brethren now I've stirred up a wasp nest before and if I didn't handle things right it didn't end very well for me some people don't know of any kind of stirring up but that if they can stir up strife that's what they live to do but the Bible talks about stirring up or provoking one another unto love. Now, you know a little bit about love now, don't you? A sacrificial love. A love that can be seen. A love that esteems others better than themselves. A love that desires every brother and sister to be walking the straight and narrow way. A love that says, I appreciate your position. I appreciate your rights. I appreciate you. 
Hebrews 10, 24 says we're to do that with brethren. That is to provoke or stir them up to love and good works. An important means of doing this is the assembling of the church together, wherein we worship God according to His will, and in that worship we're stirring up one another into love and good works, Hebrews 10, 25. But when we have brethren who just don't see the need of assembling, they're way down the road. They are way down the road in weakness in the faith. One reason why some don't love as they ought is because they do not assemble as God commands them. The Lord put a great deal of importance on the assembling of the saints and what went on in those assemblies. If you've read your New Testament and paid attention to what you read, you know that. It's not the only thing to do, but it, the assembly plays an integral part in godliness in your life. By carefully studying our Father's love for us, our Savior's love for us, and in our frequent assemblies wherein we stir up each other to love and good works, we can develop and we can grow the kind of love by which all will know that we are Christians. Final thought or two, this love is demonstrated. I go back on the assemblies again, and in these assemblies of exhortation, which is what they are as we worship God, we do have guests come from time to time. We have an opportunity then to demonstrate our love and concern and happiness for them. I'll tell you something I witnessed many, many years ago, and it stayed with me all these years. I still feel bad about it. You know, every small town or at least most of them that I've ever seen, will have some derelict in it. Now, we can't use that in a big town because we've got derelicts all over the place, but, but in a small town there used to be some guy that was noted for not being all right upstairs, and everybody in the whole town knew him, and they all kind of worked around him. He just didn't have it. <laughs> That's all there is to it as far as getting around. This fellow lived in an old beat up house by himself he wasn't somebody that lived under the bridge he actually had a house such as it was I doubt he took a bath very often at all but one time we were having a meeting and he came he sat down on about the back seat back there and there was one of our dear faithful kind sisters who at that time was probably late 60s and his odor wasn't too good. And he came and sat down and caused no problems. Everybody in town knew him, like I say. And when we got through, she proceeded to preach him a sermon that wouldn't wait. Well, now he needed to take a bath, and he needed to do this, and he needed to do that. And that was the end of that. Now, whether the man was even accountable to God or not, I don't know. For some reason, that never did fit in my mind, hospitality. It never did fit in my mind, Christian conduct and concern for the other person and the plight that man was in. I think James must have had some of that in mind when he said, you, you ask the rich person to come up and take the good seat and you put the poor person down here at your footstool. That's always been a problem in the church. And I might say, since we mentioned about some of these uh, fellows we call bums around here, and it's obvious, as Ken said, this one fella has got a problem. There but for the grace of God go I and you. While we must protect ourselves and we must be mindful of those things and be careful, we still must keep a right attitude. Now the fellow I'm talking about earlier, the old fellow, he wasn't a danger to anybody unless it's a danger to himself. And so some people aren't in shape like I think this fellow Ken's talking about is. He could be a problem. And you don't ever know. And we have to be careful about that. But there is something saying, consider the other person's plight. And as a child of God, known by our love, a sacrificial love, a seen love, that they deal with others where we find them.
Doesn't mean we don't, are not careful. Remember another time I was coming from a gospel meeting and I rode up with a brother way out in the country up in the Ozarks. And on the way back in, winding around those roads, it was summer, so it was still daylight after the services. I didn't preach that long. It was still daylight. And as we ran into the curve, here was a fellow, a really young man. I'm, you know, there's nobody anywhere in the country. It's not like around here. And he's laying on the side of the road, just stretched out, totally unconscious. Well, the fellow driving was from that area, and he thought he recognized the guy, and he did. But we were concerned. I think we have an example of finding somebody in that shape and how the Lord thought people ought to do when they find them. But, you know, that didn't mean that we just threw caution to the wind. And so we were able to stay in the car, roll the window down, and arouse him. Find out he was drunk and he just fell out there. So while you try to find out if there's help, it can be done, you still don't lose your senses on the other teachings of the Bible, saying that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. There was another one one time, and you see all. As I rounded the curve heading out to the church building in that same location, only as much further down south, but still in the mountains. Here off to the side, and there was a big uh, area to the side off the road, but two cars pulled off, and there was a man and woman standing their backs against the fence, and another man facing them, and he had a double bit axe, just like this. Uh, now, I assure you, you will be cautious and understand the meaning of the word, see then that you walk circumspectly before you stop and run out there. And the woman saw me and was running out toward the road. Help, help, he's crazy, he's going to kill us. Well, just up the road, about like from here to the road out there, was... Deputy Sheriff's house. And it just seemed like to me that's something he ought to handle. <laughs> and so I drove up there and told him, and he stepped back in. I think I cared for those people. I didn't know who they were. I think I cared for the fellow up there on the side of the road and seeing it put him there through drink. But I think I had an obligation, the Bible teaches just as much, as I love them to know how to be careful about everything and again not throw caution to the wind be circumspect and to be careful so as we go out to let Christ be seen in us in this sacrificial love of doing unto others as we would have them do unto us for by this shall all men know that you are my disciples then one of the big things is that we speak the truth watch it in love in love of God, in love of the truth we speak, in love of the people to whom the truth is spoke. That's very, very important. From time to time, we are together in ways that others can see us. In our neighborhoods, we work with other Christians. We are associated with them. We have various assemblies, maybe school. Now, what do, do, does the world see in us when we're there? Do we blow our stack before a whole school board or what else? Or do we act sanely? Do we act as if somebody who, maybe we're opposing something totally wrong. I hope we would oppose something wrong, not right. So there's a way that we can present ourselves and show forth the love that we need to even in the proclamation and defense of the gospel. By this, all will know that we belong to Christ. So we need to reveal a strong love. We need to reveal an appreciation for others. You remember, when Paul was told in one of his speaking, he said, much learning doth make thee mad. And he said, oh no. I speak the words of truth and soberness. And that's the way it ought to be. And then he was said, said one time, well, almost I persuaded me to be a Christian. He said, I would that you're not almost, but altogether persuaded to be like me. I'm paraphrasing. Accept these bonds. We need to show a sincere interest in each other's well-being and everybody's well-being. People see Christ in us. Our brethren see Christ in us. Where there are differences, 
There's a way to handle those things. I brought this sermon out primarily because of an article I wrote in which some people are saying basically all there is to it is kindness and love and sweetness and all this kind of thing. And how they would define love, I guarantee you, would not be the way the New Testament defines in Greek the agape love. It gets far beyond the emotional attachment situation. It gets into action. And the truth of God guides us in our actions. We need to be long-suffering. We need to be quick to forgive and, brethren, repent. Even as quick as we want Christ to forgive us when we repent. How quickly is that? Jesus has revealed, then, a powerful tool to persuade the world that we are His. And certainly we show our godliness by faithfulness to His doctrine, John 8, 32. But in a world that cares little for doctrinal distinctiveness, and even in a church it grows more that way, Christ-like love for one another is how Jesus would have us convince the world, John 13, 34, and 35. And that love demands that we try to help each other when it comes to walking the straight and narrow way of truth that keeps us on the road to heaven. If anybody is advocating a love of any kind that causes the doctrine of Jesus Christ to be denigrated, be rejected, that is a false love and a false teacher. You don't learn about the love of Christ except that you learn it from the word of Christ and the example that he gave. And how much is said in the Bible about the proof of one's love. Even to the apostles, if you love me, ye will keep my commandments. If you confess your love for your brethren, that's good. That's wholesome. When you try to be patient with people and long-suffering, as you would have them to be patient and long-suffering with you, that's what it's all about. So we need to provide opportunities to grow and display our love. And I close with provoke one another to love and good works. So I close where I started. Jesus said, a new commandment I give to you that ye love one another. So I have loved you that ye also love one another. By this all will know that you are my disciples. If you have love one for another. John 13, 34 and 35. I will close with this one because it's written by John who heard all of that originally and wrote to Christians and is known as the apostle of love in 1 John 4, 11. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. But we better learn what it is and what it means in our lives. If you're not a child of God, we're calling you to a life of love through the gospel of Christ the love for God, the love for His Word, and the love for God living. You need to obey the gospel by believing in Christ, repenting of your sins, confessing your faith in Christ, and being baptized for the remission of sins. As a child of God, are we growing in this love? Are we showing this love? Is it visible in our lives? If you have sinned in some way, we urge you to repent and do it now. All together we stand and sing.